outside to uh, to do what we're going to do now. Thanks very much for, for coming today. It's so wonderful to see so many people. And a big thank you to, to SJ and to John for opening their home to us. Thank you so much. And for all who's helped put some of their food together, a uh, big thank you. Uh, so uh, um, bless you for, for what you've done. Um, we're only going to be in here about 30 or so minutes. Matt's going to open up with a couple of songs of worship. Then I'm just going to take us a little bit further on the journey that we're in for the uh, coming to its conclusion, really, in the uh, 28th chapter. Do you want this one, John? Yeah. <laughs> well, you can take it back. Everyone's trying to push it back. Do you know what? When we were just starting to think about um, healing, God, God moving us to, to start a, a little movement where some people may want to come together and uh, worship and listen to the word, um, we thought that actually this was going to be you know, the place we, that we will be meeting each week, but uh, God had different plans because this is obviously too small for all of us. So, um, praise God for that, hey? Yeah. And so, next week we will be back in the community centre from four o'clock as, as usual. So, um, if, if, if you don't want to stand up and worship, that's fine. If you do stand up, feel free. There's not a lot of space. Um, <laughs> No liturgical dancing or jigging around. <laughs> that might be a bit too much in this. Yeah, oh, my wife says. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, you, you've got more room around you than anyone else has. So, uh, they know what you're like. Um, let's, let, let's pray and then I'll ask Matt to come up and uh, read us in a couple of songs. Um, whilst I'm praying, the words are on this sheet of paper. I've printed out about 35, which should be enough. Uh, but if not, you can, you can share. Can you take one? Pass it on. But let me pray first. Father, we're so thankful for your love for us. Lord, we're, many of us are still just reliving what happened last week and how you moved in power amongst us and how we saw the lives of three wonderful people being touched by your Holy Spirit. And we, we celebrate that and we celebrate them. And, uh, Zoe's with us today, but Aaron and Walter are We pray, Holy Spirit, that you will continue to keep them safe in the palm of your hands. Uh, help um, them to flourish as they uh, give their hearts to you and as they live in the Holy Spirit from, from here on in. And uh, gracious God, for this short time that we spend in this space, Lord, we, we pray that your Holy Spirit will come and uh, open our eyes to your word and the wonders that are there within your scriptures and Lord help us to connect with you, help our hearts to be in tune with your hearts as we worship for this brief moment. May this be a moment in the week where we say God you're our everything, you're our first and our last and we, we want to worship you collectively with our brothers and sisters to say Lord you, are, you mean everything to us and without you we recognise that our lives would indeed fall apart and so God please where where we need that touch of encouragement today, where we need a, a hand of healing upon our, our hearts or our heads or even our bodies today, I pray, God, may that come flooding in through this place and may people be ministered to by your grace today, we pray. So, Lord, receive our worship. Receive our adoration and devotion unto you because, God, we, we all say you are worthy you are worthy of all of our praise. We love you. We worship you. Jesus, come and move amongst us by your spirit today, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thanks. Thanks, Mark. I was going to use that. No, no, no. no. Just, uh, just <laughs>
whilst Matt just plays, if any of you want to speak out in prayer, or praise, adoration, <coughs> prayers of petition, or intercession, please, please do. Lord, you know the depths of our hearts, and you love us the same. We thank you for the grace. Lord, we, we acknowledge today that we, we get it wrong. We get it wrong so often, so frequently, and yet you love us the same. Pray that we would be completely washed in the blood of Jesus today, sanctified by the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, that even after we, we go from this place, that we'll go renewed and changed. We'll go with a stronger conviction and desire to press in closer to you, to grow in you, to put a bigger smile on your face than we were able to yesterday. To walk in the will of our God and lay down our own agendas. You know the depths of our heart and you love us the same. Thank you for such a mercy. A mercy that we cannot find anywhere else. And you don't count our sins against us. you never strike us off. That you've never had enough with us. You love us the same. Thank you for your love and your encouragement today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> right, this is going to be interesting. I don't want kids 
behind me making shapes for instance, <laughs> and all that thing, you know. Just because there's people here, kids, doesn't mean I won't, you know. <laughs> right, um, I, you know, this is going to be a short, short mess, shorter, <laughs> shorter message than usual. And, you know, if, if SJ had brought some strawberries in, uh, had I go, would I go over 20 minutes, you could start throwing strawberries at me to, uh, to, to finish me up. But what we're going to be looking at today is we're in the last chapter of the book of Acts, chapter 28. I'll finish it to, uh, next week. Um, and this is where Paul goes to, uh, to Malta, effectively. So we're going to be following on from that shipwreck that uh, he found himself in. And there are some great treasures to unearth it. I'm just going to look at 10 verses. So if you've got your Bibles or your phones, um, pull out Acts 28. And it says this. After we were brought safely through, so thanks be to God, we then learned that the island that we were on was called Malta. So it's kind of safe to assume that they never even heard of Malta. The native people showed us unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and welcomed us all, because it had begun to rain and it was cold. When Paul had gathered a bundle of um, sticks together and put them on the fire, a viper came out because of the great heat and fastened on his hand. When the native people saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, Well, no doubt this man is a murderer. Though he has escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. He, however, shook off the creature into the fire, and it suffered, and he suffered no harm. There were, they were waiting for him to swell up or to suddenly fall down dead. But when, he had, when they had waited a long time and saw that no misfortune had come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. Now, in the neighbourhood of that place were lands belonging to the chief man of the island, named Publius, who received us and entertained us hospita hospi hospitably for three days. And it happened after the father of Publius lay sick with a fever and dysentery. And Paul visited him and prayed, and putting his hands on him, healed him. And when this had taken place, the rest of the people on the island who had had diseases came also and were cured. They also honoured us greatly. And when we were about to set sail, they put us on, they put on board whatever we needed. Now, when I, when I read a story like this, you know, a story like this with venomous snakes, it gives me the heebie <coughs> jeebies you know, I'm, I'm not really frightened of snakes, I don't know what you think about snakes, but I can honestly say I'm not really a fan of death. Um, and that probably started, uh, here we go, we've got our first heckler, um, and that probably started, um, when my dad, when I was about the age of seven or eight, invited me to watch uh, La Raiders of the Lost Ark with him. You know, the Harrison Ford film where um, um, he gets thrown into this pit of snakes. Do you, have you ever seen it? Have you seen it? And he has this eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball moment with a cobra. And so I read this story like this and I go, ooh. But anyway, uh, back to one side for a moment. There are some wonderful nuggets to pull out of this passage, short as it is. I want to bring out three points today. And from the very beginning then, I want to just highlight and reveal to you and show you again that the point number one, that God turns our, our beatings into blessings. He turns our beatings into blessings. You know, there are a couple of um, philosophies out there at the moment that are, uh, in our world, um, that are completely uh, untrue. A lot of people hold to this notion that bad things come in there we go. You've all heard it. People live by that truth. Well, there's absolutely there's nonsense. There's no truth to it. But people do live their lives fearing that this, this philosophy, that you know, if they break a bone or they have a car crash, they'll be hiding under the table because of what will come next. There are so many people who live under the superstition of life. You know, they live their lives based on fingers crossed or touch words or looking at the tea leaves or um, the horoscopes or things like that. They'll look at magpies or black cats or, or crows and they'll be living on this, this, this superstition. Uh, and it's absolutely nonsense. But here we do find that Paul has to go through three things. He goes through that, that, that storm, he goes through the shipwreck and now he's bitten by a snake. And the inhabitants of Malta believed that this was just justice catching up with him, but not so. You know, because here's another false philosophy out there, that a lot of people think that when bad things happen to you, they, they must assume then that this is God's disappointment, or God's 
judgment upon you for, for how you've lived your life. We, we can see that in, in the Bible, in the story of Job, where Job's three so-called friends just criticise him for his sin, and hence that's why he's being suffering the way that he is. But that's not true either, because bad things happen to good people, as good things happen to bad people too. See, in this situation, God in his sovereignty allows these things to happen to Paul as he allows them to happen to us. Sometimes we cannot understand why. Uh, on the face of it, you'd think that Paul has just entered another tragic situation. You think, hallelujah, that he survived the storm and the shipwreck, but now to get bitten by a snake is tragic. But actually, here's the point where God is turning his bruises into blessings. And let me explain why. What was Paul's sole ambition? To get to Rome. It was to get to Rome. But his, his heart's desire, his calling from God, was to do what? To preach the gospel to the Gentiles. To see people get saved. To see lives in the Gentile world, us pagans, um, us infidels, if you like, come to know that there is a God and that God can be their God, our God too. So Paul had this wonderful heart. We can read this in the book of Romans. He just longed for people to get saved and get right with God. So all these bruises that were inflicted onto Paul became a wonderful blessing because he went to Malta and people got saved in their multitudes. So what we need to look at is that when we're taking a beating, <coughs> look forward to the blessing. When you're carrying bruises, look forward to the blessings that are coming. You know, I can say this, you know, uh, and, and some of you will know the journey that my family had been on um, you know, a couple of years ago. It was a, it was a terrible experience for, for us. And um, it, it came at an unexpected time from um, unexpected places through most unexpected people. And, and although we could say that we were then going through a valley and it felt like the valley of the shadow of death, it, you know, it felt like everything was being dashed upon the rocks and we were going to end up in a shipwreck. And, and even since then we've seen the vipers still biting, but what we can see through the bruises are the blessings. This is the blessing. God's glory is the blessing. That he's chosen to start a movement in Ledbury with you people. That's a, that's a blessing. So through all the, the beatings and the bruises, I want you also to be encouraged that there are blessings on the horizon. So when you're going through the storms, I, I want to encourage you to look up because the blessings are coming. If you're taking a beating right now, know that the blessing is coming. If you're nursing your bruises right now, you need to hear that the blessing is coming. If you're feeling tired and you're worn out with life, know that there's a blessing coming. And it's so true. Look at this second point that I'm going to come on to. You see, some of the bruises and the beatings come to us through works of People, you know, God turns all things together for good, and what people might mean for evil, God will turn for good. Um, but sometimes it says a work of the evil one. But the second point is that God defeats the serpents in our lives. This is no accident whatsoever that this is one of the last stories told in the book of Acts. All disciples who have set their heart on following Jesus at some point or other will get bitten. You see, when Paul said over... In Malta, he's not bitten by a raccoon or a baboon or a wild cat. He is bitten by a snake, a serpent. And you can start to put the two and two together. You know, in the you know the analogy used for God, for Jesus, um, from the animal kingdom is is what? It's a lion and it's a lamb. The analogy that depicts Satan from the animal kingdom is a snake, a serpent. Absolutely, Genesis three. You know, you know, the first book in the Bible, Satan is that slippery, crafty, cunning snake in the garden that causes Adam and Eve to sin and that all of humanity follows suit afterwards, taking on his nature. Devastating. Revelation 12, last book in the Bible, it talks about the serpent of old who was the devil. So the devil manifests himself as one of these slippery snakes. 
And every true disciple needs to know these three things about that. Snakes bite. Snakes bite. And they continue to bite today. You know, there's, an old, there's a drink on the, uh, on the market, not that I've sampled one of these for about 25 years, but it is actually called snake bite. And, and a snake bite is a mix of <coughs> lager and cider, and it makes, I've seen it, I've not experienced it, it wasn't meant for me, but it makes people go through lally, you know? And, you know, it's lethal. And when Satan bites, he puts poison into people that will make them go through lally. It will make people not think straight, uh, not have the right thinking about who he is or about what life's all about. You'll, you'll begin to start to believe his lies to the point where you could even abandon your faith. Uh, because Paul even writes to the church in Corinth on this subject. He says, I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts, Paul says to his church in, in Corinth, will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. So when the snake bites, he can make you go do lally. And notice that this, this serpent uh, in Moultrie comes out of the flames. He doesn't want to be in the flame, that's where he's going to end up, but he doesn't want to be burned. So he comes out of the flames, uh, and he comes out bitter, he comes out enraged, and he strikes. He strikes the first victim that he can get his fangs into. But you know what? It doesn't strike any of the inhabitants on the island. He strikes the man of God. He strikes the man of God, and you have to see the spiritual overtones here. There's some beloved people that when we start to put the heat on to Satan, when we start witnessing in the name of Jesus, when we start stepping up to the plate, praying for healing, praying for supernatural moves of God, we're putting the heat on to Satan. And that makes Satan get all hot and bothered under the collar. Satan is not bothered by a mega church that is making minimum impact. Satan is not bothered by a hundred people that are worshipping uh, if they're making no impact. Because he's already lost those people. Satan feels the heat when the church, a little church, is just gung-ho and going to try and do everything to change a culture, to transform the lives of people. That's when the snake bites. Beloved, if you follow the Lord Jesus, and what I mean by if you follow the Lord Jesus, if you are you know, mirroring his work, if you're longing for the things that he longs for, if you're longing to see the transformation in people's lives, then guess what's going to happen? You're going to get bit. Doesn't sound very attractive, does it? <laughs> but that is the truth of walking the walk that we've got to walk with Jesus. And, you know, Malta, uh, Malta was the devil's island. Because in effect, it had its false gods. It was full uh, of idolatry. And, and, you know, this serpent then is sliding around, slithering, singing to himself that he managed to enslave the inhabitants of that, uh, that island into their idolatry. That was until the man of God turned up on the beach. And the first thing this serpent seeks to do is to put an end to Paul before he can begin a ministry there. You see, the devil knows who are and who will be a threat to his kingdom. The devil has taken, I believe, many bites, even at Kiln Church within our first year, so that we might be defeated before we would, would begin. But here, here you go, you must know this too. And uh, we must take confidence in this. The second thing we should know, that the wounds that he inflicts are not fake. The wounds he inflicts are not fake. So when the serpent bites, when the serpent has his fangs into you, this is not fatal and neither will it end in death. You know, I, there are times, aren't there, when we feel like we've got kind of poison running through our veins, when we feel like we're dying from the inside. But you need to draw strength from this and realise that when he bites, it's not fatal. It won't end in death. You know, of course, you know, you wonder what was going on with that. Um, 
you know, did, did, the, did the snake have no fangs? Did it have no poison? Well, of course it did because it was hanging, it says in the scriptures, it was actually hanging from his hands. But it didn't bother Paul. It didn't bother Paul for this reason, because he knew that Jesus was the antidote. Not only does God turn our burdens and our beatings into blessings, he turns our snake bites into blessings too. So if Satan is tempting you, if he's testing you, if you know that Satan has his fangs in you, you need to tell that snake, you're not taking me down. You're not having my life. Because you belong to Jesus, who has the power to save. So his poison, listen, it has no power over you. And we know that the, the head of Satan was crushed at the cross. And so in effect, you might say as a child of God now that the serpent is toothless and spineless. The Bible says that if we resist the devil, if we resist him, he will flee. Third thing we need to know about this is that this snake is what? It's thrown into the fire. Quite literally, Paul shakes this snake off into the flames. And this is an encouragement for all of us. If we know Revelation, Revelation chapter 20 talks about uh, a time where Satan will be thrown into the fires of hell. A time is coming where he will not be able to attack the church or the children of God any longer. His fate has been sealed. And he knows his time is short. We, most of us here, we believe we are living in the end days. And so Satan has little time before the Lord comes again for his second coming. But when he comes, the Lord will judge the living and the dead and he will throw the devil into the fire and into the flames to join who, the people who were there before him, which is the false prophet and the antichrist. And so this is our encouragement as we continue to march on as a church that although the snake bites, it's not fatal. My third point, and I'm coming into to land slowly. I'll take a few minutes around, I reckon, <laughs> before I get there. Only one more point. And, and it's something else to be excited by. Because when, as we look at this, this, this point uh, and this narrative, we see that it's not, we should see not Malta, but we should now kind of put our eyes to our own location. Let's say Ledbury and slightly beyond. This is such an encouraging story because God turns our beatings into blessings. God is the remedy to the attacks of the serpent. And thirdly, God brings miracles to Malta. In a land of false gods and idols and serpents, the power of God turns up. What does this show us? It shows us one thing about God, that God rules the nations. He rules the nations. Malta is a, a tiny little country, if you know, it's about 70 miles by, uh, by 9 miles wide. And today, there's even a settlement there, it's the largest settlement, called St. Paul's Bay. And it, it comes as a result of this biblical story that has lasted 2,000 years. Uh, the only thing we know about Malta in Paul's day is that they were adulterous people. You know, they had snakes on their island, they had false gods on their island. They were kind and generous, but they still had that as their, their kind of source. And, and so when um, Publius, the uh, chief of the island, his father becomes sick with fever and dysentery, Paul heals him. He lays hands on him and heals him. And it's easy to miss two important facts here. Because by the end of Acts, we've seen all the healings. We've gone, yeah, yeah, seen it all before. But we mustn't just get too used to this. Because what we're seeing here is that God, God actually loves to heal pagans. He loves to heal people who actually aren't like us. He loves to heal people who are even idol <laughs> worshippers. God will heal all. And there are plenty of people around us who might fit into that category. And so none of us at any time should be frightened or wary about praying for God's healing power to become upon them. Secondly, what you've got to see is how the power of God turns up in a dramatic way in what we can describe and, and what Paul would probably understand as a pretty insignificant place. A pretty nothing land. They didn't even know about it. What was this island called? Oh, Malta it was called. Okay, so God isn't confined to the 
to the holy centre. He's not merely manifesting himself in the mega churches. God will manifest himself where he likes them. Do you believe that he can manifest himself here amongst us at Kiln? Do you believe that he can manifest himself in the, in the town of Lebri and the areas around us? Yeah, we, we do. We do. You know, what we did here, and, and you know, the, the final message here is basically the, the, one of the, this story being one of the final messages in Acts, probably you know, the final message in Acts. It's, it's the springboard for, for Acts 29 and for the movement of the church because do you really see what's happening here? God healed a nation. Everyone on that island was healed. The entire island. They all came to Paul and they all got healed. Do you know what this says? God is the hope for our nation. God is the hope for our land. God is the hope for Ledbury. God, if God can heal a nation of Malta, God can heal this place. And wouldn't it be great if God started with Ledbury? Because we, a bunch of maybe misfits, come together by the grace of God, can go forward in the power of God, praying for the pagans. Yes, we'll get bitten, but it doesn't end in... Uh, it's not fatal for us, but we'll continue to go because we believe that God heals nations today. Amen? Amen. Amen. A nation was changed. Thanks, son. <laughs> he can do it in Hebrew. You know, in Hebrew, Satan will, will, will bite us. You know, he will. He'll do all that he can to discourage us. But we all need to remember that this isn't going to be fatal. It won't be fatal for any of us. It won't be fatal for any of us if we can hang on to God. And this is the hope that we're hanging on to, that he can heal a nation. And this is why it's at the very back of the book of Acts, because he wants all of us to believe, yes, God can heal Ledbury as he healed Malta. God can save Ledbury as he saved Malta. God can save your families. God can save your marriages. God can save all your relationships. You've got to believe it because this is the last story in the book of Acts. And that's meant to be our springboard for Acts 29. Next week we're going to see, as every believer, we have actually a decision to make. That's kind of the summary of what next passage, the next passage will be. We have a decision to make. Will we carry a cross to see that this might come into fruition? That we might see a nation saved. Amen? Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Thanks, kids. You're great. Do you make any faces? Are you hearing all this behind the back? I saw them smiling a couple of times. <laughs> Father, we thank you so much for such an encouraging word in these ten verses. A narrative that we've read so many times of the snake biting Malta, but the spiritual overtones and the spiritual encouragements we see in this passage. We delight in you. We rejoice in you. We thank you that this gives us courage for today and confidence for tomorrow that we can step forward as God's people in the name of Jesus to see a nation transformed, to see a people changed within our locality. And God, we pray that, that would, your power would descend upon us, that your spirit would come on the people of Lebri as it did in the people of Malta, that you would change a nation, that you would save a nation, that you would heal a nation, and that we might be brave enough to, to face the cobras and the vipers of this world. And yes, even if we get bitten, Lord, we will trust that it won't be fatal. It won't be damaging to us. Because you, Jesus, are not only the world's antidote, you are our antidote too. For we love you, Jesus. Encourage us um, as we move forward in your precious name. Amen? Amen. 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 Thank you, everybody. Thanks for, for cramming in. It's a bit warm now, isn't it? We're all a bit toasty in, in here. Um, so we're going to meet next week at uh, the community centre as normal at four o'clock. Um, and then the week after, that's our anniversary service. You know? We've been going for a year. It's brilliant, isn't it? Though? We've been going for a year and we want to give glory to God. So one thing I'd like to do on that service is, is just ask if there's any testimonies from any of you guys. What Kilm has meant to you, what God's done in this last year for your faith, 
Um, it would be really good to uh, share with one another the, the power of God and the move of God in our own lives, that we might encourage each other by it. Is that okay? So have a think over these next uh, couple of weeks. If you're prepared to, to sh share something, that will be wonderful. God bless you, everybody. Lovely to see you as always. Take care. Thank you, David.